Yeah, hello everyone and a very warm welcome. My name is Leopold Grün and I'm the director of Vision Kino. It's good to see you so many people interested in learning about European cooperation for the benefit of film education. As you know, this event is also under the German EU Council presidency. I would have rather welcomed you in the city of Erfurt, <coughs> where our eighth Congress Vision Kino impulses for film education in the European focus would be taking place right now. But due to the pandemic uh, conditions, we had to postpone it to June 2021, in case just uh, you are interested. A nationwide Congress every second year is one of the core tasks of Vision Kino, which I would like to introduce very briefly to those of you who don't know us and our work. Vision Kino is a film and media competence network active throughout Germany, providing a service for educational film work in and outside schools. The organization was founded in 2005 by the Federal Commissioner for Cultural and the Media, BKM, and the German Federal Film Board, FFA and the German Film Industry Association Kino macht Schule with Association for Film Distributors and two associations of film theaters and the German Cinematic Foundation. Vision Kino aims to heighten the perception of film as a cultural good, especially among children and young people, and develop an awareness of cinema as both an experiential and educational location. The long-term aim is to enhance the skills needed to decipher moving pictures and foster greater knowledge of film is its traditions not only but also in order to develop an audience for tomorrow. To achieve that aim, we create opportunities, pathways and learning experiences for young learners to enter the universe of film. Yeah, and uh, closely related to the aim of creating those opportunities and learning experiences for the young audience is one location, which at the moment we do miss very dearly, the cinema. As we all know, cinemas are closed due to the pandemic in many European countries right now. And as much as we hope that the cinema will overcome the momentary crisis, we are very well aware that the situation is crucial. More and more films made for the big screens go directly online and the use of streaming platform has skyrocketed over the last month. Even film festivals, which are especially important for the outreach towards the young audience, switched to hybrid or complete online editions. And while the recent crisis is foremost seen as an economical one, we must be aware that this is also a cultural one. So now more than ever, we are confronted with the question, if and how, we can regain or even enhance the culture of cinema going once the pandemic is over. Now, more than ever, we have to find ways to make cinema appealing and exciting again for the young audience. Now, more than ever, it is not the time to bury our heads in the sand. And this is why we're here today, with stakeholders from all over Europe who have devoted their work to make cinema a unique, worthwhile and fun experience for the young audience. They will share their experience with us today and discuss opportunities as well as challenges. My name is Nicola Jones and I'm the CEO of the German Children's Media Foundation, Golden Sparrow. In this function, we are running a festival here in Gera and Erfurt in the region of Thuringia. And under the roof of the foundation, we also carry out other activities and projects. One of the activities and is the, initiatives, is the initiative Kids Regio, which is also a subgroup of the network of regional film funds in Europe, Cine Regio. Kids Regio has initiated this panel together with Vivian Kino, and I have now the pleasure to introduce my brilliant colleague, the project manager of Kids Regio, Anne Schwutka. Thank you very much, Nicola. And I know how hard it is to speak into a screen. It's very weird. Very warm welcome to, to all of you. Thank you for joining us today. And uh, like Nicola already mentioned, um, Kids Regio belongs to the Golden Sparrow in Germany and to Cine Regio on a European level, which means we are active in the industry, sharing best practices as much as we can. And we are also um, 
active in, in lobby work. So this year gave us the opportunity to launch a project that combined both of these sides that Kitzregio is active in. We launched this project under the German presidency of the European Council and we had big plans and we are very excited. So we wanted to start in the beginning of July in Rijeka, Croatia, um, just after Croatia gave the presidency to Germany. Unfortunately, we had to move this um, panel and conference that we had planned there to September. And then unfortunately we had to move it online, but we shared many best practices, um, met a lot of people from all over Europe in active in film education. The second part would have been end of October in Brussels. I say would have been because this as well had to be postponed this time to 2021, but we will be active in Brussels next year. We will keep lobbying for film education and for the young audience. And then the third part, and for us the, the most important thing, because it's in Germany during the German presidency, or it would have been in Germany, like Leopold said, we would have been guests at the Vision Kino Congress. And this Congress, like Leopold mentioned, is also moved to 2021, but we still wanted to do something this November, still wanted to do something during the German presidency. So we are here today with all of you. I'm so happy that our panel joined us and our moderator, Paul Tyler, is now coming on stage with me. He will guide you through the morning session. Very warm welcome to Paul and I will hand over to him. He will introduce you to everyone else. Hello, hi, welcome everybody. Um, <clears throat> Zoom, it's a little bit like talking to an empty fridge really, isn't it? But um, I assume that there's many people out there. And um, what a great opportunity we've got here today because um, when you look through all the, um, uh, when you hear uh, Nicola and Leopold and Anna speaking there, and also when you look at the stuff that's online and we know what's coming up with the various different term speakers, um, there are some really good aims and I've tried to distill those aims down into three points so that we have a very clear purpose for, uh, for the next couple of hours. Um, it's very much about raising awareness of the importance of cultural spaces for young audiences about sharing knowledge and discussing the role and opportunities for film education and cinema culture in a transnational dialogue. And thirdly, how to revolutionise cinema and make it more appealing to a young audience and win them over as long-term visitors. And I think that's particularly exciting because the fact that we know that with the vaccine coming in the next few months, we, we hope, then suddenly our cinema door is going to be open again and there's going to be huge opportunities for people to start thinking and to rethinking about what cinema is about. Now, uh, we have uh, six speakers today uh, that you're going to be here, six panellists. They are representatives from the European cinema and film education sector, and they will here to share and discuss their experiences in best practice. Now, what's the danger of something like today? Well, there's two things that could happen. One is that you could all sit back and just marvel at all the various different best practices that have been created by these six speakers today uh, and, 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 uh, and amaze yourselves at what they've been able to do in their various different cities and regions. And the second thing that could happen is that the speakers, in a way, could talk about what their best practice, what they've developed in their different regions and cities without actually really sort of going into and revealing the inner workings of their magic. And I don't want that to happen. What I want to happen is I want all of you to be sitting there alert like detectives trying to deconstruct and try to unravel and to try to decode what's really going on. I want, to, I want you to pull back the curtain, as it were, and to try to work out their alchemy. Okay, And I think that's crucial so that you can really truly get something from this experience rather than just simply yet another Zoom conference with things just washing over you. So, detective hats on uh, for our first speaker, or our first ma magician, as it were. Um, now, there are probably all sorts of writers, directors and producers out there in the Swiss film industry who would happily reference the Magic Lantern as being the place that really truly inspired them with a love of film. Our first panellist is someone who has worked within the organisation for, I believe, four years. He's here to talk about cinema as a dialogue uh, in terms of film mediation. So will you please give a big welcome to Lorenzo Berardelli. Please come on stage. Good morning. I am very pleased that La La Lantern Magic can participate in today's panel. My name is Lorenzo Berardelli and I am a coordinator at the Swiss Umbrella Association of La Lantern Magic, in English, The Magic Lantern. Thank you very much for participating and organizing this important panel 
which allows us all to find new inspiration. La Lanterne Magique is an international film club for children aged 6 to 12 and is almost 30 years old. In Switzerland, we do have 77 film clubs. 24,000 children are film club members and around 800 volunteers organize in local cinemas each year up to 900 screenings. Abroad, there are 18 film clubs in nine different countries. Our pedagogical concept is based on these two main aspects, the social dimension of the cinema and the preparation before the screening. The preparation consists of three elements. First, a booklet that is sent to each member some days before the screening and that presents the film and explains certain technical, historical, cultural, or thematic aspects. Second, a moderation at the cinema where there is a dialogue between the children and the moderator. And third, a scenic introduction like a small stage play where three professional actors or cultural mediators ex explain in a playful way an important aspect of the film. So La Lanterne Magic is providing a first film education and film culture. It's very successful and it enjoys a broad support among the Swiss public authorities because in Switzerland, each language region has its own curriculum and film education is not treated on its own as a separate subject, but is only dealt within a cross-curricular manner. Well, before presenting our latest project, I would like to introduce you shortly uh, to our project, the short cinema lessons that is still going on. These are short films by Swiss and international authors, so filmmakers that are, share some of their art and knowledge with young spectators. Each short film explores a different aspect of filmmaking and an interactive participative website invites user to get to the heart of the author approach. Together with media, we have dubbed and subtitled these shorts in different languages. Please check out the website listed at the end of my presentation for further information. Well, four years ago, we've developed a new project that is called La Petite Lanterne, so the small lantern that is aimed at younger children aged between four and six. In Switzerland, children aged four to six have little opportunity to discover films adapted to their age at the cinema, because normally they discover films at home via their parents' smartphones, tablets, laptops. They discover audiovisual content, which often has led little educational and artistic interest. So the project of La Petite Lanterne fills obviously a gap in this age category because uh, at home the children at this age uh, see mostly audiovisual content which often has little educational and artistic interest. By encouraging their active participation as well as dialogue within families, La Petite Lanterne promotes films and the cinema as vectors of social bonding and openness to the, uh, to the world. And it encourages an initial awakening to the cinema. And obviously, as in the case of reading and writing, the language of images is more easily acquired if it is approached from an early age. Age. In Europe, audiovisual productions for young people has been developed a lot. Short film programs for children aged two to eight are common, but these offers are designed uh, for an age range that is too broad to respect the sensibilities of the youngest. Moreover, no distributor imports these programs to Switzerland because it isn't profitable. As a result, four to six-year-olds are nearly forgotten in the programming of Swiss cinemas. The fact is there are really only a few cinemas in Switzerland that offer screenings for children at this age. When they do, 
it is not within an educational framework. Based on this observation, we do offer La Petite Lanterne, whose concept really is for children aged four to six, while offering them an important educational and social framework. So between their fourth and sixth birthday, children have the opportunity to attend at least six screenings together with their parents or grandparents. Each screening has two parts of 30 minutes each. Led by a so-called film explorer, the audience is introduced to the topic of the screening by showing and explaining topic-related clips of film classics. The second part is a short film program. Thanks to the previous preparation, the four to six-year-olds are now able to understand better the shorts and hence appreciate them even more. There are six topics, each for one screening, such as being a spectator, film music, diversity of filmmaking around the world, dealing with strong emotions, or different film techniques. In terms of content, rhythm, and volume, the short films are appropriate for small children, but are certainly interesting for adults as well. And this makes the screening of the shorts a wonderful educational experience for children, but also for their parents. Parents and children can deepen their discovery once they get home online on the website and participate, participate which offers an educational and interactive games related to the topic of each of the six screenings. Well, La Petite Lanterne is actually a great success. While in the first years we held 14 screenings in five different cities, today there are more than 90 screenings in more than 30 cities. Now I want to recall the two main aspects uh, that our concept is based on. Uh, first, the social dimension of cinema where people, children, watch very different films together with others and then exchange views on their film experience across generations. Second, preparation. We want to take the children by the hand, give them the tools so they, that they can better understand and appreciate the film. This enables them to judge a film on their own and to develop their own critical attitude. Naturally, both projects, La Lanterne Magique and La Petite Lanterne are complementary. Many children who have attended the screenings of La Petite Lanterne become later club members of La Lanterne Magique. Now, if you're curious, please visit our websites or do write us an email. Well, I am really looking forward to the questions of the participants and to the discussions with my colleagues here on the panel. And long live the cinema. Thank you very much. That's really kind of you. Thank you very much, Lorenzo. Uh, nice to see you and nice to see your presentation there. So um, we will be doing a panel session later on, so we'll be able to dive d deeper into some of these issues uh, and, we'll be able to, and you'll be able to put your questions out there to us as well. So our next speaker goes by the name of Boba, uh, but to give her official title, or at least her official name, she's Slobodanka uh, Miskovic, and she's Director of Art Kino Croatia. I can see she's here now with us. Having spoken to her briefly, I get the sense that she creates magic in her own city by the sea. Uh, so here's a chance for you to deconstruct that magic as she introduces you to cinema as a cultural space, um, cooperation with other institutions. So, uh, Boba, the stage is yours. Uh, hello to everyone. First of all, I would like to say that I'm really, very, really uh, very sad that we are not in Erfurt right now. Uh, and also that uh, I hope that next summer um, you will join us in Rijeka. Uh, at the opening of uh, one uh, completely new cultural venue called Children's House that is dedicated completely uh, to children. 
uh, and basically not just in order to teach them about film and art, but um, we aim to uh, somehow push them to start creating their own art and uh, to um, express their own ideas uh, through the language of arts. Uh, right now, I would like to start a presentation. Uh, so, uh, in order to maybe introduce you uh, to our work and um, to uh, uh, say a little bit more about Children's House. Here we are in uh, Art Kino in uh, Rijeka in Croatia. Uh, this picture shows us uh, scenes maybe from a year ago before um, COVID 19. Uh, and Art Kino is a public institution. Uh, our vision is uh, to serve as a vibrant and welcoming center of cultural and social life in Rijeka uh, and, uh, region, uh, and uh, wider regions. Uh, in uh, Art Kino, first screenings took place back in 1926 and we were uh, reopened in 2018. Uh, so, um, we have four main uh, programs, film programs, activities for children and youth, educational and media programs, and support to film production in Primorje and uh, Goransky, Gorski Kotar counties. Uh, we have uh, uh, several venues, uh, but also we have future venue, Children's House. Um, and uh, I, I will tell you a little bit more about Children's House uh, in, um, in the next few slides. Uh, but first of all, uh, I have to say that we have really very, very uh, a lots of young audience programs like school at cinema, regular film programs on weekends, workshops, uh, premieres of films made by children, uh, uh, toboggan festival, traveling work workshops. Uh, so basically, we are really very dedicated uh, to um, education of children and youth. Uh, as you maybe know, Rijeka is the uh, European capital of culture of uh, 2020. And basically the biggest um, legacy of uh, this project uh, is uh, our new cultural venues in former industrial complex. Uh, not just children's house, but also a new museum of modern and contemporary art, uh, city library, uh, city museums, and so on. Uh, but for us, the most important is children's house uh, that is going to be a mixture between cultural and educational center, production center, uh, basically experimental hub for children that are uh, old um, uh, until tw 12 years old. Uh, what is new in all this uh, is that this venue is going to be led by uh, three uh, city cultural institutions like uh, Art Kino, City Puppet Theatre and Rijeka City Library. Uh, as you can see, uh, the future venue is going to consist of um, cinema venue, music and audio visual production studios, open air cinema on the rooftop and different flexible spaces like living rooms, players, playrooms, um, rooms for playing, for lectures, for meetings and so on. Uh, basically, Children's House is not just a new venue, it's a new format, a program format and new direction for art uh, education. Uh, we would like to equip children with analytical and practical skills to understand and more importantly to apply language of arts uh, and to encourage them to uh, participate in creating and to, develop, uh, to express themselves uh, through the language of arts. So this is new object. Uh, this children's house is going to be open in February uh, next year. Uh, and the uh, program will integrate uh, different art forms, uh, film, performances, visual arts, music, also in a close connection with new media and technologies. Uh, this is our future cinema uh, venue. Um, it's really very, very, very nice. Uh, um, 
but uh, what is also very important is to say that uh, parallel with construction work, uh, we have uh, we already prepared uh, many programs and we already uh, are building our audiences as well as partnership network. Uh, so one of the most important program for a future uh, new venue is Tobogan Festival, Festival of Children's Creativity. Uh, Mm, uh, Tobogan Festival is a festival that is uh, committed to uh, active holidays for children and youth. Uh, it had first edition uh, uh, four years ago uh, and it was organized by Art Kino, other city institution and also with lots of uh, non-governmental uh, organizations. Uh, in preparing festival we usually consult uh, children uh, because uh, we know in this moment that, that cultural needs and habits of new generations are all already very, very changed due to numerous social, technological and our other factors. Um, so we have many activities, uh, but the um, program is basically uh, made on um, uh, uh, on one side we have workshops and then on the other side we have public uh, programs. Uh, workshops are for children, of course, and um, public pr programs are for a uh, whole family. Um, so, uh, at Tobogan we have lots of uh, animated short films, workshops, uh, playing with film, video reporting, stop animation, documentary films, uh, uh, dubbing workshops, uh, video mapping, uh, lots of uh, 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 lots of activities uh, that are um, uh, that uh, basically um, in which we want uh, children to uh, somehow to push to uh, to create their own uh, own works. Um, also, every year we, uh, uh, at final uh, event at Tobogan, we uh, screen um, results of the workshops. Uh, that means short films or a theater plays or um, any other results and products of uh, workshops. Uh, here are some uh, photos, of course, uh, because uh, maybe it's much easier to understand what, what kind uh, of program uh, Tobogan uh, uh, creates. Uh, and also one activity uh, which is really very important are uh, workshops for teachers because we try to uh, establish better relationships uh, with teachers and together uh, we try to understand uh, how to teach kids about art. Uh, uh, those are photos of uh, our final event. Uh, as you can see, uh, at final event, children are, children uh, uh, has the main role, uh, and uh, we screen, as uh, I said, uh, results of the workshops, short films. Uh, uh, so uh, basically, I would like in this moment maybe to share with you a short trailer of Tobogan, uh, if we can, um, or maybe we can put it at the end. Uh, uh, besides Tobogan, we have lots of other uh, activities for children. One of them is uh, traveling film workshops that we uh, run in schools. Uh, when children develop their script, uh, they shoot, they edit the films, uh, and um, we cooperated with eight primary schools in Rijeka. Uh, at the end of each uh, school year, we make uh, gala screening at Art Kino. Um, and one uh, of the most important program is school at the cinema. Uh, last year, for example, in this program, uh, uh, 15,000 uh, children participated. Of course, this year, everything is different due to COVID, but uh, we managed somehow to um, establish online version of this program in order to maintain close relationship with children and uh, with kids. Um, so those are numbers, as you can see uh, in this um, 
numbers are basically, how should I say, the same because lots of school embraced it, this online uh, version. Uh, I hope that next year we will be able uh, to uh, bring kids back to cinema, of course. Um, and uh, basically, uh, what, shall I, what shall I say, say uh, in the end is that in programming, we often consult young people and uh, children uh, about programming because uh, uh, we know that um, we should better understand cultural needs and habits of new generations that are constantly changing. Uh, and basically, it's clear uh, for us that youngsters often see their role as uh, participa participatory and that they have strong need uh, to uh, actively participate in creation and implementation of programs. Uh, also, I would like to, um, to use this opportunity to um, invite you all at the opening of the children's house um, the new space for uh, children uh, activities and for children uh, culture uh, and uh, maybe to repeat once again that uh, this new venue is going to be all about uh, children creating the arts, uh, not about uh, teaching us, um, teaching them about uh, art and film culture and so on. Um, well, if, if uh, I've gathered there are actually 101 people uh, participants watching at the moment so if we could hear them all round of applause we would which would be lovely sadly we can't but what a great presentation so rich huge amounts of stuff that's going on there and makes our job even harder to be able to sort of unpick that and to try to understand how is that all coming about something that we will try and think about a little bit later on very nice to hear the uh, Rayeka police coming in the background there um, I thought some of those lovely slides of those children sitting outside watching the the, the, the cinema the films they, they look like stills from a film in themselves, didn't they? Really beautiful. So um, one of the speakers later on, Mark Cosgrove, who we'll be talking to later. Don't put your camera on yet, Mark. Uh, Bobby, you should be talking to him because they have a space that he'll be talking about. And I'm sure there's a lot of stuff that, as you are developing this children's house, stuff that you might be able to learn uh, from Mark. Anyway, but before we go to Mark, we're going to go to someone else um, now, and we're going to go to France, uh, now a country that we all know that is uh, uh, steeped in uh, uh, culture and is very purposeful when it comes to culture and the education of culture for its young people. Um, Julianne uh, Herro is, uh, works for the educational department at the uh, Cyclic Centre in the Val du Loire. Uh, as a regional funder and supporter. And what I found particularly interesting, and I, maybe it's going to come up during his talk, is the, uh, the influence that he has, that they have, as both funders and supporters, uh, and being able to shorten the gap between artists and audience. So, uh, Julien, uh, the stage is yours. Please welcome. Thank you, Paul, and uh, thank you, Vision Kino and Kid Radio, for this invitation this morning. I work for Cyclic, uh, Centre Val de Loire, which is a public agency founded in 2012 by the Centre Val de Loire region and the French state, Ministry of Culture. We offer um, cultural public services, which are the results of a tight collaboration between these two institutions. The missions that are carried out and the actions that are developed by Cyclic are based on cooperation, research, innovation, and backing creation. As you can see, we have uh, five different departments. The creation department, which is a regional fund for audiovisual projects and professional support. Um, we also support emergence of new artists. There is also a diffusion department, which propose culture to our neighbors by um, movie trucks. We do have movie theaters in trucks, which are traveling all over the region. Uh, there is also the education department, which I speak from, so I will uh, talk to, uh, I will talk about the department just after this uh, slide. There is a book department, which is the equivalent of the creation department, but for books, for regional authors and professionals. We do support bookstores, editors from the region. And there is finally a patrimony department, which uh, shares the territory's filmed memories uh, by digitalizing and putting online um, home movies made by uh, people from the, from the region. We are also uh, both members of Cine Regio and the ECFA, the European Children's Film Association, which is important because, uh, as um, Paul said, 
we also uh, we try to to do uh, more and more uh, links between creation and education uh, in our um, department uh, in the education department activities so this um, education department we are seven working in it which is uh, quite uh, good uh, even in france uh, we promote artistic education in terms of words and images we are not only working on movies and images, we also work on, uh, lit uh, on literature. Uh, and to do so, we uh, work through four different aspects, which are raising awareness, screenings, training sessions for teachers and adults, and publishing. So we develop um, projects that enable meetings between the audience, the artists, and their work, with a specific attention on local artists, this is where the link between creation and the education departments are very important for us because we, are, um, we really think that we need to give responsibilities to local artists that we can support. And this is also uh, something very important that we, that we are going to, to work on in the next months and years, hopefully with uh, other European structures. We, uh, we, we need to consider young people not only as uh, an audience right now, but also as a potential movie artist that can be involved in movie creation. This is very important for us to, to make uh, artists and young audience uh, work together because we have to uh, define how the young public will show movies and understand movies within the next years. So we are at Cyclic, uh, Regional Center of Image Education. We coordinate a lot of um, programs especially with high school students, since in France, um, high schools are regulated by regions. So we mostly work with uh, uh, students from 15 to 19 year years old. And to do so, we uh, offer many workshops and uh, digital uh, devices on a website, which is called UPOPI, and I will talk about it uh, a bit later as well. Um, for just that you know that we in, uh, within a year, we are able to do like more of 400 uh, workshops uh, and we do more than 30 sessions for uh, training sessions for teachers, uh, adults, mediators as well. So it involved a lot of, uh, a lot of people. I will take the example of high school students and apprentices to the movies uh, that we call in France uh, Lycéen et Apprenti au Cinéma. It's a big project, it's a national project that we coordinate in the region. Um, and it brings every year more than 15,000 uh, students and 600 teachers three times a year uh, in movie theaters to um, the see movie that students won't probably wouldn't see by themselves. For example, this year, this fall, we were, su we were supposed to, to, uh, to work on Nicola, uh, Nicolas Ray's Johnny Guitar. Uh, with COVID-19, uh, it was a bit difficult, but uh, we did some... Uh, some uh, things, uh, uh, we did some things. So what we proposed in the program was um, artistic workshops for the high school students. Um, most of them were a remake uh, of a sequence from the movie. It's very important for, for us to, uh, to propose a practices a workshop in, uh, in the project. And it's also very important for us to, uh, to do um, workshops on uh, aesthetics and history um, of movies, not only practices, but also to, uh, to understand how movies are, are made. We did also training sessions for teachers, so online uh, because of COVID-19, but it's very important for us to, uh, to build projects not only for the children, but also for adults who work with and for them. Um, this is why we do a lot of training sessions for teachers, also for mediators when we work with uh, out school, out of school uh, students and, uh, and public. But uh, we, we cannot imagine uh, a program, a project, without thinking about tools that we would give to uh, adults to work with the children and the students because we are not always in front of the children in the classrooms. Uh, we do so many uh, workshops, so many actions that we can't be any, everywhere. So we need also to uh, train uh, teachers to, uh, to be able to um, talk about literature or uh, movies to the students. And we do comp complementary online resources as well. On the UPOPI website uh, about Johnny Guitar, we dedicated a, a specific issue on Western, on the Western uh, last September. You can see the, the front page uh, of it. 
So I'm going to talk about UPOP right now, which is a, a film education platform with ped pedagogical timelines and courses. We also videos, tutorials, short movies, and games. And we also have on this uh, website an online course on the vocabulary of film analysis. Um, UPOP helps users to understand the images around. Uh, we try to meet society, society's needs, that is to say, accessing a culture of images, which is today essential in order to acquire a free and sensible, and sensible understanding. We have five main topics on the website, which are analyzing, learning, passing on, watching, and gaming. It's uh, more than 250 contents available for free. And we just reached the um, 1 million pages viewed within the last 12 months, which is big, big success. And which something which is probably interesting for you guys all is that we do have some contents in English, um, a timeline about the history of uh, animated movies, for example. And we are going to launch the online course in English as well, hopefully within the, the end um, of the year. But uh, there will be um, definitions, uh, case studies, exercises, all available in English. It's uh, a course with uh, uh, 11 lessons that uh, everybody can uh, do. It's free, all is free uh, on UPOPI. And, um, and I hope we will be able to launch it, to launch it and to uh, get back to you to, uh, to give you the link uh, within the next uh, weeks, or hopefully uh, the beginning of 2021. So as you can see, uh, we do a lot of things on the field, in classrooms, many workshops, but we also do many things on, online because we really think that today, especially today, we know with a, with a COVID-19 crisis and the fact that we have to, to, to imagine new ways to, to, um, to speak about movies and to do things with teachers and students, it's very important for us to also develop uh, many online resources. Uh, and since they have a, a, a lot of success with one million uh, pages view within the last 12 months, we are going to continue to, to work on, uh, on that um, in the next months. And if you want to write to me, this is my email address right here. Thank you very much, Julian. We will be coming back and seeing you a little bit later on. So, um, gosh, it's getting richer and richer. There's so much content out there, so much going on. Maybe some of you out there know about these things and they, you already know about these various different programs that are happening around Europe. And maybe for some of these, it's a complete eye-opener. It's an eye-opener for me, apart from the preparation that I did. Uh, just a little note, if um, it would be great if you could start thinking about some Q&A. If you've got questions, put them in the Q&A. Don't go to the chat button. For some reason, the chat button hasn't been disabled, but that's in the, the Zoom gods, they know about that. But if you have some questions in the Q&A, please put them into the Q&A and then we can then use them later on to be able to ask some pertinent questions to our speakers. Now, who's next? Next one, as I mentioned just before, we have a gentleman. Um, I was going to say from my own uh, my home country, uh, country, as I'm living in Denmark now, I'm referring back to um, good old Blighty. But he's not from my home country. Uh, he's from my home kingdom, as I'm sure he'll recognise. Uh, he's a Scot uh, who's been living in Bristol, a fantastic city, uh, a city that I've visited many times. And since 1994, I do believe he's been cinema curator at the Watershed, uh, which is also a venue that I've visited in Bristol. So um, please welcome and come up to the screen. Turn your camera on, please. Mr. Mark Cosgrove, uh, who will be here to talk about cinemas of space, uh, architecture and location. Take it away, Mark. Uh, th thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, yeah, I, uh, I'm Mark Cosgrove. I'm Scottish um, and I work in England. Uh, I work in Bristol um, in the South West and I'm the cinema curator um, at Watershed. Um, and I've been there um, for a couple of decades now and seen quite... Um, really interesting developments and transitions in how we work with young people and the focus um, that we have for uh, young audiences and the engagements that we that we um, operate with. Um, I'm going to uh, talk through some of the current um, work that we do with, with young audiences um, but I'll also use um, an example from about 10 years ago of a project um, called Relays which we, it, it was a partnership with the Cultural Olympiad 
Um, it was when the Olympics were in London and there was a lot of cultural activity which took place across the UK. Um, and we took part. It wasn't, it didn't seem like a natural um, subject matter fit, sport um, and, and cinema or sport and watershed. But actually, it led to um, a really interesting engagement with young people, which I'll, I, I will talk about later. And I think it illustrates a point about um, the importance of the relationship with the building and with the organisation. So I, I say um, Watershed is a, a, a three screen uh, cinema uh, with a member of Europa Cinemas. Um, and it's always a great pleasure and privilege to um, be on panels with European colleagues certainly hope it's going to be something that we can do in the future. Um, Watershed is a three screen uh, cultural cinema um, and it's also a cross art form. We do a lot of work with technology um, and creativity uh, and working with um, universities as well. Um, but some of the current initiatives that we have in relationship to young people and particularly that age group which is 15 to 25 year old um, and one thing that we did, which made a huge difference, and I'll, I'll illustrate that later as well, is that um, we took the, the uh, a step of just having a five pound ticket for under 25 years of age. And you know that question about access, we felt was really important and that it, was, it shouldn't just be about a particular time of day or a particular um, slot, screening slot, but it should be across the board. Um, so we did this a few years back and it had a dramatic effect and we did a campaign which you can see here um, about be astonished and be amazed by, by cinema um, and targeted you know as a blanket way that under 20 under 25 and this is this is watershed we are a, a, a converted um, a, a warehouse Victorian warehouse on the dock side um, in the city centre of Bristol um, and because of the architecture of the building, we have um, some really interesting spaces, um, which you can see uh, here on the screen. This is the cafe bar, which is in the middle of the building here. Um, and it forms this kind of center point between these flexible spaces um, and the cinema. Um, the cinema, uh, uh, unfortunately, is what it's like at the moment, which is empty, um, but will soon be uh, reopened, I, I hope. Uh, these are th three um, sort of projects that we are very active with um, in relationship to uh, young audiences. Um, we work with a range of partners, and I think this is a kind of key point I would make, is that it's, it's, it's working in partnership and it's co-curation and co-creation that is key to our practice. Um, we work with the British Film Institute um, on a number of projects, um, one of which is the um, BFI Film Academy. Uh, and this is about talent development for 16 to 19 year olds, um, which is about skills development, but also um, because it's based in Watershed and it's about the relationship between watching films and making them. We also host um, Rife Magazine, which is a young person's uh, magazine completely created content by young people, which is published online. And it's not necessarily, um, it's not actually to do with cinema, it's to do with kind of wider issues relating to young people, but it's housed within Watershed. And we take people on um, on a secondment basis, um, on a rolling three month basis. So it's constantly refreshed. And what is brilliant is that these are young people that are in the building that are refreshing me and refreshing the organization. Um, as well as producing content, talking to young audiences in Bristol. Um, and then industry events, um, which we do with a range of different um, partners. But when we have, um, for example, if I'm programming a film and I have a, a director coming to Watershed and the director's talking to the audience about their film, I will get them to come to the building um, earlier in the day and they will do industry. They will do an industry event, bespoke event for the young audience. Um, sorry, for the the BFI Film Academy, for example, um, so young practitioners. So these are kind of three planks, as it were, um, of of engagement with young people, which feeds into um, so my own practice as well as those people, those young people being in the building um, and actually engaging with the social spaces. Um, the, the flexible spaces that I showed you, and also the cinema. And the, this is illustrative of some of the activities and the engagements between the cinema programme 
um, and th th those young people that are um, on those projects. Um, we work with, again, with the BFI and with the Film Audience Network, which is a regional um, audience development um, initiative to develop audiences for um, specialised in art cinema. Um, and we support developing audiences for um, new film releases. So what you can see here is a couple of um, illustrations from a few years back. One was The Fits, which is an American independent film, um, which is about a young black dancer. Um, and we got some of the Rife magazine that I mentioned earlier to work in partnership with us on the release of that film. And you can see a workshop, that they, not a workshop, it was a, it was, um, um, it was a dance um, in the centre of town um, uh, to promote the film, but also to get people engaged with some of the themes of the film. Similarly with Mustang, the Turkish film, um, we got Rife magazine to watch that film in advance. Um, it's a film about young people. Um, and to introduce the screening um, and also to create content online. And here was um, a festival that we do, Cinema Rediscovered. Um, this is Leslie Harris, the director of Just Another Girl on the IRT, uh, uh, an American independent film from way back that we, we wanted to kind of rediscover. And this was one of the Rife designers who created this um, T-shirt for the, from the film poster for that film. So it's all these sets of relationships um, and connections which with, with, with the kind of heart of it being the building, the organisation watershed the building, um, but also the cinema programme is a kind of engine that is driving the, the, relation, the sets of relationships and providing content. This was the impact of the um, taking the, the five pound ticket blanket ticket price for under 25s. Um, you can see the immediate impact of, um, of that. Going back to um, the building itself, um, then in the project that I mentioned earlier, um, the Cultural Olympiad, it was a project called Relays. And as I say, it brought together um, sport, culture, um, and media literacy was a, um, that we applied for funding um, and worked in partnership with a range of um, universities, the, the universities and other sports and cultural organisations. And I just wanted to show you a clip from it because it, it, showed, it, what, it was aimed at schools um, and sort of older teenagers that were doing uh, media literacy uh, and English. And we brought together um, the schools with uh, an author um, and sports writer, David Goldblatt, into the cinema to watch a short Norwegian film, um, which I, I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of it, um, but it was a fantastic short film about um, a young boy who's waking up in the morning and his, his waking up is being commentated on by two sports commentators. So it's a kind of funny short film about a young um, teenager's uh, life being commentated in a sports way. And we used that, screening it in the cinema, getting the school kids in um, to watch the film. Um, and then David would um, give them some projects about how you commentate on something, how you describe something. Um, um, and specific projects would be run, as I say, in the flexible space within um, Watershed. So I'm just going to show you um, a, a, a minute or so um, of a short film that we made about the Relays project, which I think illustrates um, that relate, that those sets of relationships with the school, with media literacy, and with the building. So this, um, uh, this is in the cinema um, that, we, that was shown earlier. Parallel to this public programme, we have been running and developing a series of innovative media literacy and citizen journalism projects which are engaging young people in critical writing, journalistic and technological skills. Media literacy is, as with any form of literacy, comes in different forms. You know, with kind of literacy with the printed word, there's a level at which, okay, you a whole different sort of ranges of reading and I suppose media literacy in these classes are about very gently introducing the idea that um, 
A film or a documentary record needs to be actively read more, rather than just kind of passively absorbed. It's a different style of learning rather than school, you know, you normally do a PowerPoint here, you sort of you learn better I think and it's more interesting how they give the information to you. It makes you gain more confidence and it makes you feel like you can do something and answer without anyone judging you. What, what I wanted to do um, just by um, with those two school kids talking, when they, that was them in, in Watershed and being part of the um, event that, that we hosted, um, when we did a debrief on this um, project, one of the things that the school teacher said was that the, the, school, the, the kids that they brought to Watershed had never been to Watershed. Um, and what the kids talked about was how much they enjoyed Watershed. And actually a couple of them would regularly now go to Watershed with their skateboards and hang out. And for me, um, you know, that was, that was what um, I thought was really positive and I took from that uh, event was the fact that the young people felt Watershed was theirs. And that, that experience that they had in the building um, they felt that that was their space and that they could, um, it was part of their culture now. Um, and I don't know if they've then gone on to see films. I, hope, I, I certainly hope that they have, but they now know that Watershed is a place that they can feel is theirs. Um, Okay, Mark, listen, we're going to have to cut you short there, I'm afraid, because okay. uh, we've, we've gone nicely over time. But thank you so much for such a rich... Uh, I'm going to get you to, 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 to kill your camera, and then we're going to go into the next speaker. Thank you so much. I do... I hate... I hate cutting these people off, but it's just that horrible thing, old time. Uh, thank you for introducing us to those three very interesting planks that you talked about and, uh, and revealing some of the incredible impact that, um, that you're doing at Watershed. So uh, we will be coming back to Mark a little bit later in the Q&A. Uh, so we haven't got rid of him completely, um, luckily. Uh, and now uh, the last project um, uh, is uh, Anna uh, Sira is the project coordinator and project manager for Otok Institute in Slovenia. I probably mispronounced her surname. I knew I would. Um, when I finally got to, when we got to chat in advance of this conversation, we discovered a kind of really interesting, or at least I thought a interesting chicken and egg situation where where do you end up uh, doing what you're doing um, particularly in regards to her relationship with the Europe European culture and how whether or not it's about how the influence that European funding has to drive uh, European culture so um, to possibly explore that chicken and egg who knows let's see what happens but to talk about the promotion of European culture through cinema please welcome Anna thank you very much Paul for inviting us and uh, for allowing us to share our experience. Uh, yes, I will focus uh, today not so much on uh, what we do with the children, but more on um, how we got the opportunity to uh, work with them at all. Uh, I'm going to uh, represent our uh, institute uh, today. Uh, which is an NGO, um, and um, Autoc is an institute that um, is basically um, located, let's say it's a hybrid uh, NGO, because we have two offices. Uh, one is in the center of the country, in Ljubljana, and the other one is in way in the west, at the coastal area, in Isola, uh, where we uh, also conduct the majority or almost all of our activities. So if you see uh, on this map, it's we are right on the bottom left leg of this Slovenian chicken. Um, and this, the, the dark red spot is Isola, uh, the place where it all started. Uh, this is the area also where um, um, our major um, event has been going on that we have had for 16 years now, and it is Kino Otok Isola Cinema International Film Festival. Uh, so this was what we uh, were doing, let's say, as our main activity until 2013. Uh, from 2013, we decided to focus highly on film education, and therefore, um, we started doing uh, different kind of programs and activities. 
uh, one of the first things was, of course, focusing um, largely uh, during the festival to create this kind of uh, children, youth, and family section submarine. And at the same on year, uh, we became partner to the uh, FI Young Audience Award. So we were representative for Slovenia. And ever since then, we are still the partner. And it, it is one of our uh, really nice, nicest and largest events uh, that gathers children from all over the country. So uh, from 2013 is, let's say, from around 2015 came this biggest shift that I will talk about um, uh, later on. So I will just uh, say the projects that sort of um, are the European projects that we will uh, be talking about later. And now we were a part of uh, Adam project. This was the, our, our first one um, as a partner. And then we became partners in um, two simultaneous project, Moving Cinema and the Film Corner project. Uh, we just got the support for the next edition of Moving Cinema, so we are continuing with that one as partners. And then we also uh, are partners in uh, the project Movies in Motion, which is not a part of uh, Film Education Call. Uh, but we have a uh, big focus on uh, children's programs also within this uh, project. And then we have several other events, uh, projects, um, um, or just screenings within this region, um, which I will not talk about um, here. So um, from our starting point, uh, for starting, uh, let's say, looking at film education was that um, we were facing several different issues uh, in the region where we worked at. This is a region, it's a coastal region and it's placed between it, Italy and Croatia. So it's a small region, but, uh, you know, very, has this international influence and it's got a few towns but mainly a lot of villages uh, all around so the the situation was and still is uh, looks uh, with, within the film area that there is only one active art cinema in this whole region and this is our partner cinema which we, with which we collaborate um, and this also means that uh, we don't have our own premises so we mainly work with partners. Um, there was no film education offer for children. If the activities were, they were sparse and we basically were the, almost the only provider uh, within a larger scale. Uh, there was no local funding for film education projects. Uh, they even cut our funding for the main event film education event. Uh, so this was on, let's say, the local regional level. And then what was happening at that time in the country was that film education uh, was not developed on a national level on, um, you know, any kind of in co comprehensive way. There was no film education in schools. It was basically uh, up to individual organizations to uh, create their own programs. Uh, there was a very minimal national funding for film education, so it was hard to count on any support uh, from that side. Um, so what we were facing is the questions um, what does the region need? And we were asking ourselves also, what does the film area in Slovenia need? Uh, where we realized that, of course, there is a lack of film education programs. So we saw this as a massive opportunity for us to create something, to do something about it. Uh, we saw that we are the we, we are able to provide this decentralized focus, you know, this uh, uh, on other areas than, that are not just the capital and the center of the country. Um, 
so this is still one of the really important factors that we uh, can use and oh sorry and then we were also we saw that there are a lot of opportunities to create connections uh, with other areas uh, because you know we had to adapt to a situation where we uh, had to build everything from the bottom on um, this also included you know to make partnerships with other regions and also other countries so uh, the minus at that time was that uh, our our main local funding for our uh, festival also got cut to half, which also meant that we were on the, like on the verge of no existence. Um, so we were struggling with the question how to even do what we actually want to do. Uh, so this funding uh, still hasn't increased since then. So that's why we were just looking for what is the other ways to you know get the means so uh, our plan was this following um, what we saw is that okay we want to make uh, this happen we want to uh, start you know immersing fully in film education but how do we do that uh, and still we survive you know so that our institute doesn't uh, stop functioning so what we saw is that we can only reach sustainability through international cooperation because if we're so limited you know within our area there are opportunities uh within outside in the world so the first step we did is, of course, research. We um, checked possible international partners. Uh, what are the criteria for applications to Creative Europe Media? We identified projects that we could manage because we realized that um, we are a small NGO. So that also meant, you know, some of the project um, just require higher financial um, input right at the beginning. Uh, so we sort of already understood through that, through what kind of projects is this, what is what would work and what wouldn't work in our region. Uh, then we defined what is our priority age group, uh, which was at the beginning primary school children uh, and quite quickly later on, we also spread it to kindergartens and then to high schools. So now we have our focus is from three to 18 years old. So then we just started, you know, going around. We started creating partnerships with local schools. Uh, we started talking to teachers uh, about what do they need um, because teachers were really not uh, connected that much to film you know they uh, didn't have this habit of um, introducing children to film because they had all, no place to take them to so um, then because we didn't have our own venue we used the alternative way we started creating partnerships with local clubs libraries uh, a theater uh, sometimes bars and other hubs so uh, we set up events there uh, like uh, one of the major ones is local youth club uh, and uh, we use them for workshops and so on or just some separate screenings so um, we had really a diverse range of locations um, for these kind of events and screenings uh and then we also went to schools with the films so we brought films to classrooms uh we had projects that actually were focused on uh screening films and working with children in the schools um, so that that was co very complementary um and we tried to spread uh this kind of you know um uh, european films uh throughout the this web in the region 
uh, that so so it's not all focused only on one cinema location. Um, and then one important aspect was also that uh, we were through these uh, European uh, projects, we were able to share uh, not just films, but also filmmaking from children with uh, from other countries. So our children were able to see what kids in other countries do and reflect on that. And that um, often proved uh, quite a valuable uh, thing. Um, looking at their feedback. So uh, after that, we actually got uh, our first uh, year-round support for our film education projects uh, by Slovenian Film Center in uh, last year. Uh, so this is now becoming a sort of more stable, let's say, period for our functioning. And at the same time, there was this big uh, jump um, regarding film education in the country because it came uh, as an optional subject into school cu curriculums. So we were also, there was another op opportunity because of this, because teachers now are really happy to get some kind of um, training uh, and uh, help, you know, uh, to conduct the subjects in their schools. And um, we also do these kind of trainings to provide them, you know, or, or just encourage them sometimes, you know, um, how to do the subject in schools. So currently, um, of course, we are faced from going uh, very much on, uh, you know, around the field to going completely online. Uh, so we are defining what that could bring us, what kind of a situation it is. Uh, we tried out two major international events uh, and so far we, we realized that it's a good opportunity to use this online momentum to actually build the audience uh, so that we can bring them then back um, to the locations. And then of course our uh, question remains, you know, how to ensure further sustainability in these ever-changing circumstances. Uh, but we will see what happens. And um, Anna, we're going to have to I'm going to wrap you up soon because you're, you're we, we've gone a little bit over, I'm afraid. Uh, okay, yeah, that's I'm actually finished. I just wanted to show the map how because it's interesting, you know, we work mostly. Uh, this at the bottom, but lately, because we started, you know, spreading uh, our uh, programs uh, with European uh, projects more, and with becoming online, we got feedbacks from schools all over Slovenia. So now, somehow, we work with very different regions, and that's, I think, an opportunity uh, for further thinking. You know how to use this online opportunity to go, to go back to physical options. Uh, so that's it from me. Thank you for now. So uh, <laughs> you stay there, Anna. Let's, let's bring the others in um, because we're, we are going to go straight into the Q&A now. We're going to do two things. I'm just going to throw one, possibly two questions at you just to try and set the tone. There was something really lovely that Mark said. Oh, and then afterwards, we're going to open it up to a lot of the questions that have been written on the Q&A. We won't get through all of them, I'm sure, but we'll be able to touch upon some of them. Um, Mark, you said something lovely. You said uh, it's about turning people into active readers and not passively receive uh, receivers, or at least it was in your video. I can't remember if it was you or your, your speaker. Um, and this is what, again, I want the audience, um, all 101 of the participants to be just doing with you guys, is to try to, is to sort of dig down and say, look, we've just heard all this incredible uh, initiatives. I can see from the Q and A's that people are very impressed about all the various different things that are going on. But it's really to try to understand about how did these things come about and what are the dependencies. So, imagine this is a thought exercise. Imagine that we suddenly discovered there was a there was a country I don't know somewhere between France, Germany, and Belgium. It was just somewhere in the middle of Europe that nobody had discovered it, but there was a country, and that none of you knew anything about that country. But you suddenly got a posting into that country to go and do what you do. 
What are some of the things that you would want to, to know and to understand about that country in order to try and achieve some of the things that you're doing? You've talked a lot about very aspirational stuff. You talked about a lot of best practice that is addressing that stuff. But just to get a sense of what would you do if we parachuted you into this strange um, country in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of Europe, what would you have to understand of that country, of its makeup, of its financial institutions, of its resources, of its whatever you decide? But what are some of the things that you'd want to understand day one in order to kind of achieve what it is you're trying to achieve? Who would like to go first? Anybody? I can see Mark, you were thinking. <laughs> what kind of music it makes? <laughs> Why is that? Um... Because, um, you know, culture is very specific. Um, I mean, it is translatable, but it's very specific. Um, I, I'm from Glasgow. I've worked in London. I've worked in Plymouth. Um, I've worked in Manchester and I've worked in Bristol. Um, and I often say that there's a reason that trip hop came from Bristol. The musicians hate the word trip hop, but anyway, um, the, there is a reason that trip hop came from Bristol and Oasis came from Manchester. Um, and and they're, they're very specific to those places. So Oasis couldn't come from Bristol uh, or, or, or Glasgow. Um, Portishead and Massive Attack couldn't come from anywhere else. Um, and it took me it took me seven years to understand that in Crystal. So I, you I think, think you think that music is a way of decoding culture? Um, um, for a, for a long time, it took me seven seven or so years to to understand it. So I think time as well is really important. Okay, great. Come on then, Lorenzo. What would you do if I parachuted you into a into this strange foreign European country that nobody had discovered? What are some of the things? What would you do to to what would you need to understand in order to develop the sort of program that you developed? Well, first of all, I, I would have to, to look what are the needs in this country or, and, and if they also have a, a tradition of uh, volunteering because um, the Magic Lantern functions only in Switzerland because there are a lot of volunteers. Switzerland has a great tradition of, of volunteering. And besides that, I think I, if the need is there, how um, would would the backing be of the public funds? And okay. then uh, I would would try to to present my project to to get the support of the authorities. Baba, what would you uh, what would you, if we if we dropped you into this mysterious European country? What sort of things would you want to uncover in order to be able to drive the kind of initiatives that you've been doing? Uh, first of all, I would like to uncover how stable cultural uh, ecosystem is, in order to understand uh, uh, how much um, uh, how much there is, uh, how should I say, stable su financial support to cultural institutions. And then I would like to understand the uh, educational system. Uh, what are the values, what are the subjects and so on, because I think that uh, good uh, education in culture could be achieved only in cooperation between culture and education. And, and I'm sh oh, sorry, sorry about that. Yeah, well, at the end, I'd like to understand uh, cultural habits. Yes, uh, maybe even music, uh, what do they listen? Uh, but also, I would like to be very, very open uh, to, how should I say, I would like to walk on the streets and understand what, what are really cultural needs, you know, and what are uh, aspirations and uh, um, interests and so on. So Julianne, I mean, I introduced you as coming from a country that really understands its culture and is very seat in that sense of a strong purpose with culture. I drop, I parachute you into another country. You know nothing about it. What's, what's, what are your, what are your must haves on that day one? Yeah, I, I was also going to talk about needs and uh, habits. I mean, it's very important to, to live among people and to, to observe how the, 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 the rich movies, music, photography, literature, and um, 
And it's very important for, for us to, to imagine a project uh, that also comes from uh, a need for the children and for the teacher or the adults that work with them. And, uh, and then the step after that is to, to observe how it works uh, in terms of institution. I mean, if it's um, if there is um, things, tools in the educational system, in the cultural system as well. So I think it's, uh, as Max said, it's a long-term observation project and thing to, to, to be able uh, to, 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 to build on a project for that. Okay, and Anna, finally, we come back to you after your nice talk. Um, what would you, if we, we drop you into this, city, this, this country, what, what, are you, what are you looking for in order to understand what, what you need to do or what you can do? Well, we actually have kind of <clears throat> this experience coming as outsiders to some regions. So, um, yes, it, it can be quite hard when you're an outsider. So I think the first thing is really important to go among the people, see their habits, just talk to them because maybe also they have different kind of ways of functioning, uh, small towns or big cities. You know, you just have to go into maybe more coffees uh, or hang out with them more because they're used to more this kind of socializing than in bigger cities where you uh, go into more maybe uh, discovering what is this um, structural level, how, how the institutions function and so on. You, you, you'll, you'll probably hear there's a, there's a new member of the audience, a three-month-old, having a nappy change at the moment. So if she makes a noise, I do apologise. But, um, but that just proves we're all human. Um, she normally loves it. But, but in, in, you've, all, you've all talked about the idea that you would go in and you would kind of assess need. But in a way, and also you, you would absorb yourself in the sort of the cultural aspects of that, uh, the symbols, as it were, of that country to understand it. But... How explicit are those needs? I mean, how much poking do you have to do? Because sometimes I imagine some people are very explicit in the needs. We need a cultural house. And I imagine in some places, people are almost, without signing patronizing, don't really know what they need. And so therefore, there must be a kind of an interesting kind of um, dance that you have to do in that space in order to really be able to observe need, but also to kind of generate need. I mean, I imagine many of you have been in a situation where you've been actually generating need would that be fair to say who wants to answer that yes baba well i think that all cultural institutions and organizations have a very important role in society and basically that we are here to enlighten somehow you know the wider community if you understand me um, it of course needs are important uh, but here uh, we are talking also about values that we would like to uh, how should i say uh, infuse to our society uh, and uh, also uh, how should i say our starting point uh, uh, are our beliefs basically. and we believe that media literacy is key literacy of 21st century Sometimes, sometimes cultural institutions, programs, schools, um, our programs are not following this yet. And then we have to say, yes, uh, media literacy is very important to us, and we would like somehow uh, to uh, spread it uh, as, a, as the most important literacy of 21st century. You know? So this is a constant dialogue and dance, as you said. So, Mark, what, what what sort of dance do you get into when it comes to driving your beliefs and dragging out the needs from the people? Well, I, I, I mean, we we are involved in um, a sector which is about passion and enthusiasm uh, and communication. You, you know, so that's the activity that that we're in, that we the the I'm involved in, and I think you know we're involved in. And I say when I say I'm involved in is that there are many different kinds of cinemas. Um, you know, there's a commercial mainstream cinema, which is about an industrial model. Um, and, and, you know, that is about, you know, the, the, it's kind of about cinema as entertainment. Um, and I think, you know, the space that I'm in and the space that we're in is about, is, is about those values that Boba uh, mentioned, which is cultural values. Um, and that is driven by, you know, passions um, and enthusiasms and, and kind of what you're, I'm, I'm trying to do is, and what I'm trying to do as a, as a you know, 50 plus year old is, is support the enthusiasms and passions of the younger generation 
which is I was in that I was young once you know and and so I wanted to seek out those places that I could see things um, and then you realize that there are other people that you know want to do that but you also realize that film is an important um, communicator of social cultural values and that an independent cinema I think has a has a role to play within its um, wider um, community it's not just about audiences as in the multiplex sit model is about audiences going in for financial transactions for entertainment we, we're, we're about a completely different uh, model so julian uh, would you like to comment on that yeah um for a, a very long time in france we uh, we thought that the need will come from putting children in movie theaters and and show them movies you know and uh, now that Nowadays, children are surrounded by images and movies everywhere on their phones. We, we think more and more that um, the needs will come um, for the children in make, in, if they are in the making of a movie or of a book. So we start more and more projects by um, practices, workshops, and then we put children in front of a, a, a movie or a, a book. So I think it's very important to... to, to to, the, the need can come from for children. I mean, if I if I if I'm a child right now, if I, if I was a child, uh, it, it, it was it's fine with me if I go to movies with my uh, my teammates, uh, with my uh, my colleagues, and, uh, and maybe I can have a um, an encounter with the with the movie, and I can come out from the movie theater and uh, okay, cinema is great, uh, okay. But I think that today, if we if you put a camera in a class in the classroom with an artist, I think it will be um, maybe um, the job will be well done, and uh, I think the needs will be. This is I, I think this is how the needs can uh, come out more efficiently right now. Practice, Thank you. And then you go uh, to the movie uh, theater or you read a book. Thank you, Anna. Have you got anything to comment about that? About the way by which you extract or you push the needs of your of your communities? It, it, it often happens that, uh, you know, their needs are not uh, very pinpointed. Uh, so we, we try to sort of make sure to be the ones to, to just offer, uh, sort of generate this kind of offer that, that then can create their thinking of what exactly are their needs and then continue from there. So even, you know, just start with these uh, projects and programs and then go into the communication also what what is there that they need more that they want or less more or less this kind of approach thank you very much lorenzo can you uh, can you follow up on that in terms of understanding the drive receiving the needs or sort of driving the needs of the audience Yes, of course. I think driving <clears throat> the needs is also very important because um, when you when you know that that your project um, responds to a certain need that exists uh, in one region, you can also um, explain to 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 another region that uh, that uh, it would be very important to to give this project also to their children because, for example, in rural areas. You, you have for the children um, uh, offers in, in, in music, doing sports, but, but, but not every kid is, is fond of uh, music and sports. So, so um, it, it is important to give them also an alternative and, and to promote, for example, uh, film education. And okay. I think, yes, you can, you can also... Um, create these needs and to to make aware of them that it that they are important i think one of the interesting things that often comes out in this whole discussion is is access because i mean as i know with having four children in the house um access is a key driver i mean when you have access to something like this in your hand you know you can very quickly get hold of things and and that can make you quite passive in a way and about how do you tap it how do you encourage people to be active how do you get them to to be doing more than simply going for the path of least resistance we're going to jump now to the q a section so there are lots and lots of questions i know i won't do them all justice but let's just jump into some i see here one uh, from barbara she says thank you everyone for sharing your inspiring projects how long did it take for every single institution project to establish within the city 
and also get a loyal audience? Wow, that's a big question. Young people as well as teachers, which comes back to which come back regularly. So, folks, who wants to dare answer that? How long does it take to to establish ourselves, get get and to get loyal uh, returning audiences? Anna, do you want to start with that? Well, it took us years. In the beginning, years and years, uh, you know, uh, of slow progress. And then once we started with film education, it went on fairly quickly. So I think uh, it, it is just such an area that you get a lot of uh, um, positive and grateful feedback. So if you start somewhere working uh, in some area, um, it I think it can be very quick, quickly developed into more and more. Mark, you you uh, you, you you clearly understood the the, the 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 value of money. I mean, this five pound idea and this graph you showed us. I mean, is is that the key? I mean, how long did it take you to establish regular audiences? And I know when we talked, we talked a little about the power of the cafe as well as a kind of a as a honeypot, as it were. How long yeah, did it take yeah, you? Yeah, I mean, it's it's. Well, I mean, I was thinking Watershed was set up in 1982. Um, um, I, I've not been there since 1982, but it was set up, you know, in 1982. Um, and and so it's it it does take a it does take a, a long time. I I think I mean it's it's now part of the kind of fabric of the city, which is great. Um, it's gone through a, an evolution. Um, we've even had academics write write about it, and I can I'm happy to share anything um, about Watershed. But it is about um, I think the fact that we're a we're a, a, a converted um, older building is really quite interesting. And so that we, 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 we kind of feel open and accessible, I'd like to think. Um, and that's not just about the building being um, the, the, the design of the building, which has got open spaces like the cafe bar, which people can come in. So you don't just go into the cinema and then out the cinema. You've actually got the possibilities of, of you know, hanging about, of meeting friends. So there's all, all sorts of different um, things that can happen within the, 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 the design of the building. Um, but the five pound um, ticket thing was a very practical um, decision. Um, you know, the, there was lots of initiatives around that other people were doing around, you know, come on a Tuesday at two o'clock and you'll get a reduced ticket price. And we just thought, no, no it's about under 25s. It's democratic. It's making it more accessible. And that did see an immediate um, because, you know, for young people and, and increasingly now, I suspect, um, you know, price is, is, is going to be really important. Um, Bob, how about you? Oh, sorry, to, sorry to cut you off. Okay. Bob, uh, Bob, what about you? How long did it take you to establish regular audiences? And I noticed in the question, she talked not just about uh, maybe it's not so pertinent for you, but but both for the children and, and also for the for the for the people that come with them, the teachers, the what have you. How long did it take you to establish a kind of regular audience for that? Uh, well, I think that it uh, took ten years. Uh, of hard work and we are still working on that you know because this is a never-ending job it starts every day again um, and sometimes you have this pandemic situation and then you feel that you will have to start uh, one day all over again um, so i will say um, really this is never-ending uh, job every day is new beginning and you establish bridges connections um, with teachers with children uh, on each possible and many ways yeah. lorenzo i know that uh, magic lantern has been running for, for a long long time a little bit like there's a lot of legacy there like mark talked about with the watershed but are you able to talk about a sense of when it was that you got this because i mean the numbers that you talked about were quite incredible the 600s and the 900s and the 30 different cities and all this so but but the, i mean it must have taken time to get to that point right Yes, I think in, in 1992, as far as I know, um, there was really the need there because at the cinemas in Switzerland, there was no program for, for, for kids. So the, the, for the first screening, at the first screening, the, 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 the cinema was really full and they, they started in Neuchâtel at the French speaking uh, part um, of Switzerland. And then um, as they have, have realized that there is really this need uh, for this project um, <clears throat> they've they've created this this umbrella association and then it took them uh, several years that that 
through mouth-to-mouth -mouth, um, um, recommendation, I think, that, that also uh, the other parts of, of, of the country got interested in it. So I think if you start with a project and, and, and you really um, respond to the needs that they are there, uh, it, it, it works, uh, it can work uh, re really quick. Okay, Julianne, do you want to come, can you want to come to that? Yeah, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's maybe a bit different in, in France because uh, for Cyclic, we, uh, we coordinate high schoolers and apprentices to the movies since 1994. And uh, the department has been, um, is a, a regional center of education since 1999. So right now, when we come up with a new project, we don't have difficulties to, to find an audience in schools especially because in France, film education is also in school programs. It's not mandatory, but it's, you know, encouraged to, to, to uh, teachers to, to, to work on that. So, and also because we are a public agency with support from the state and the region, um, you know, we, teachers know that this is cyclic, that the region will, um, will uh, coordinate the project. So we don't have difficulties right now to, 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 to work with an audience because we do that more than 20 years right now but I, I imagine that at the beginning it was uh, everything was to create so yeah yeah absolutely absolutely I mean that while, while I got you Julian uh, there's there's a question that's from from Wilke Bitter uh, of Wilke Bitter and she says um, thank you for your presentation um, and uh, that your website looks very impressive for other projects and I think I know the answer to this but I'll let you answer it how do you approach filmmakers slash creators to work with you what are the incentives for them? Um, yeah, that's a nice question. Uh, just to say that in, in the program, uh, high schoolers and apprentices to the movie, so we show uh, students, uh, they go three times a year in the movie. They show two uh, long movies and one program of short movies. And we like a lot every year to bring the filmmakers of the short films uh, in um, in classrooms, and for them it's uh, it's it's really a joy and it's uh, it's really nice to come in classrooms to share other work to to share the, the passion. Uh, I mean, it's like all of us right now. We 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 like to speak about what we do every every day, and uh, so most of the teachers, are, uh, most of the filmmakers and creators, uh, have um, are really uh, happy when we uh, when we ask them to come in classrooms. Of course, they are paid, you know, for, for these interventions, but they are very happy to, to, uh, to, to come and share with, uh, with the audience. And sometimes we, uh, we also ask them to uh, do workshops with, uh, with the students, which is very important also for us. So maybe it's a tradition in France because uh, we have a lot of movie theaters, so directors come go and talk about their movies in theaters when uh, the, the movies come out in, 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 uh, in movie theaters. And, and since we also have these uh, projects uh, like high schoolers and apprentices, but it's also the same for uh, students from uh, six, uh, six years old in, uh, in, in schools and colleges from 12 to 15, there is a lot of um, solicitations for the, for the filmmakers to, to also come into uh, into classroom so but julian i mean surely i mean doesn't it slightly help the fact that you're a regional funder <laughs> i'm sorry you d yeah, don't you have a little bit of a stick that you're holding yeah of course but um the thing that we, we don't always uh program um movies that have been uh helped by uh, the, the the fund the regional fund but of course yeah it's very important for 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 us to uh, as i said uh, before in the presentation to responsibilize also to give to give responsibilities to, to the creators and um when they have been uh, financially supported by the fund uh, they have also asked to uh, they are also asked to uh, to give some time to come into classrooms and to uh, explain how they work uh, to um and it's not it's not only uh, filmmakers. I, I like a lot to work with uh, screenwriters, with uh, edit editors as well. I mean, it's very important. And uh, there is this kind of a recip I don't know the English word, but reciprocity, reciprocity. I don't know if it works, but that means that if you are helped financially to do a movie uh, with Cyclic, you have to give some time as well in the film yeah. education activity. And that must be. I mean, that must be. 
really useful to you. And I can imagine, I don't know if the others are in any of those kind of similar positions. That probably makes you unique amongst our speakers here. None, none of you others have any kind of sticks, do you? Or do you, do any of you hold any sticks? Bob, you hold a stick, do you? No, What's your no, stick? No, oh, you don't? don't have. No, we don't yeah. hold. I don't. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Okay, so I'm going to come. I just got to. Oh, Mark, you're going to say something. Well, I was just, I was just going to say, um, it's, it, it's not so much stick, but when, <laughs> um, when, when we um, have filmmakers, you know, who whose film is being released, um, they will go out on the distributor will send them out on you know a promotional tour, um, and what I do is you know so that's about being in front of a kind of general public audience but I will often arrange with a distributor for them the filmmaker to come down earlier um, and then they will do some sessions with young people um, particularly with the BFI Film Academy for example so it's kind of using the industry opportunities I got you okay um, with Lorenzo I think a lot of filmmakers are also interested to give their knowledge to the to the children. So I think they 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 are also will to 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 do that to to uh, low conditions. So I think it is important to get to the contacts and to 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 establish a, a certain network. But I think um, it is. Um, it's uh, obvious that, that a lot of filmmakers like to give their knowledge to. So in a way, going back to that first question I asked about parachuting you into, a, into this foreign European, one of the things that you probably would want to do is establish, yourself, establish good working relationships with the creatives so that you could have a kind of a one-to-one -one dialogue with them and, and bring them in as a resource, right? Because they are a, an important resource for you. Okay, um, now I've got to actually, Lorenzo, while you're on the line, I've got a question here from my good old friend, Nicole Kellhouse. Uh, hi, anyone. I'd like to know how the Magic Lantern and Petit Lantern is financed. Where, where are you getting all that, all that, all that money from, Lorenzo? <clears throat> so um, the Umbrella Association is financed by the Federal Office of Culture, uh, public, cantonal and municipal funds, as well as foundations, uh, the National Cinema Association and a few private sponsoring partnerships. So at the Umbrella Association, there are paid employees. But uh, I think uh, a big point is that all the, the seven, 77 film clubs in Switzerland are, um, uh, are independent associations that are um, organi organized by volunteers. So to, to establish such a, such a film club, you have to, to to uh, find uh, the film lovers, but normally it is the film lovers that addresses the Umbrella Association. Hey, we 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 like your project. We want to establish establish it, and then they uh, then the Umbrella Association is going to help them to find locally uh, the funding uh, for for the project, like uh, from from the. Um, uh, city of the local cinema from the from the cantons or so the state uh, and and also from private uh, sponsors but uh, you can say uh, normally two-thirds of a budget is 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 paid in the end by um by the public funds okay thank you all right i have a question um i hope that answered that for nicole i have a question here from becky parry um I'm interested in the qualifications and training of practitioners working with children and young people on these film educational projects. And also what support professional development they have access to. Um, I mean, we saw Mark, your, your gentleman who was giving his very eloquent talk about deconstructing, uh, analyzing um, uh, film. I'm curious for all of you, I mean, Mark, you're welcome to start or anybody. What, what, what act, I mean, uh, Julianne, you have your website. It's an incredible website. It's going to be in English. I just thought immediately, I just want to go there and look at it now. Um, so what is it, folks, that you have in terms of the, what, what is the level, the competency? How do you ensure, you, you're relying on a lot of goodwill, but how do you ensure that the qualifications and the training of the practitioners working with these young people is of a standard that is, that, that fits your values? Um, I, I, I can start by um, saying that David Goldblatt, who you saw talking very articulately, um, it, you, you know, approached me about doing a project about sport and film. Um, and this was, you know, 10 years ago. Um, 
I, I mean, I, I, it was through conversation with him I realised that you know he was he was bright and engaged. Um, I didn't ask for any qualifications for him, but um, he, he he was publishing. He was beginning to publish. Um, and he was teaching at the university, but you know, in retrospect, I didn't, I didn't have a form that I filled in. Um, but I, I understand the question completely um, in terms of, you, you know, who, who are these people that you put in front of young people? And we did have to, and we went through a, um, um, you, you, I can't remember the, the, the phrase now, but you know, you obviously have to have people who, um, are, you, you know, are criminal, are checked. Um, if you're putting them in front of young, if you're putting them in front of young people, you know, so there was a process whereby we we had to um, sort of validate them in terms of any criminal activities um, and safeguarding. That's the word I'm looking for is safeguarding. But in terms of like things like the BFI Film Academy, then you know we we are we are, that is being run by professionals and they have professional you know qualifications in terms of um, their own practice. Um, and then the modules that we put for the young people are, um, you know, sort of ratified by in partnership with with the British Film Institute. I got you. Uh, anybody else like to comment on about uh, the, the your how you how you kind of uh, deal with the, the the competencies and the levels of um, um, knowledge that your, your 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 practitioners have? Is that something that affects you, Anna? Um, our practitioners are mainly professionals in the film area so it's you know we're not that big of a country and the, the people that work uh, within the film are we are fairly confident that they're well equipped you know uh, to do this and it's not that big of a competition so we can share these people us and some other institutions as well no okay well so so i think my last question to you i'm going to throw one at you is just that we started off this whole zoom talk and we talked about it sounded like we were going to talk about a funeral because we talked about all the things that we've lost because of covid and all the problems and all the all the issues um i want to turn the funeral into a wedding i mean well what, what is the what is the good stuff that's going to be coming out you, you you must have experienced there must be some interesting learnings from this whole experience this whole awful experience of closing cinemas and stuff but has it has it started are there any possibilities are there any new uh, insights that you've gained around what you can be doing with the audiences and is is there anything that we could end on in a positive way in terms of when you know uh, old uh, donald trump's out we've got a vaccine coming along uh, it's going to be a great year 2021 what does 2021 mean for you guys in terms of what potential you can then do with your various different projects who wants to start with that <laughs> it's a big question i need positivity <laughs> Well, uh, I can start because I think I'm very positive at the moment from what we experienced uh, because it's, I, I think, from initial pessimism that came about, you know, what, what are we going to do? The feedback online was really great and in between we had to change our festival date so we actually had the festival uh, on the spot. So what we <coughs> saw is that people really so far respond well to online events and they want to engage online so that means they're really missing the social you know aspect and then when you bring them back to the cinema it's so much more valuable so i think in this time it's a really go good opportunity to sort of build up the audience and then when we open up again we can bring them to the cinema and show them this other aspect you know or just um in sort of uh, give them this satisfaction of live event, you know, in flesh. And that is the absolutely perfect answer. I've just managed to just lose my screen. Um, I'm not going to um, add, I'm, gonna, I'm sorry, I'm not going to open up to those because I'm very aware of time. I just want to say a huge thank you to all of you. Uh, thank you so much for uh, giving us such an amazing insight into your worlds and also being prepared to sit here and sort of um, stick your fingers in a little bit to try to understand some of these incredible, uh, some of the dependencies that actually drive these, these that, that have allowed you to create the magic. So thanks for, um, for, for, for revealing the alchemy of your magic, as it were. Anna, I'll hand over to you. I just wanted to thank uh, all of you. And there were so many questions in the Q&A section that we have not been able to tackle all of them. So maybe for all the panelists that are comfortable with sharing their email addresses in the chat with the audience, please do that so that people can contact you. Everybody is very interested in your projects and what you're doing in your countries. So I would say mission accomplished for this panel. 
And there will be a second panel this afternoon, more about film education, online possibilities to um, educate yourself in the field of film education, to have a platform to use for your film education work with, with the young, uh, with young audience, with your uh, students, for example. So tune back in at two in the afternoon, uh, Central European time. If you um, have not registered for that, you can use the same link. You can just come back to this link. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you to all the panelists and to the audience. Okay, I, I got the famous last words, uh, which are also a big thank you to all of you. Wonderful. And um, yeah, and normally I would say, you know, please go outside this lunch. Uh, sorry, I have to apologize. <laughs> so we cannot provide that today. I um, would also like to uh, thank all the, the, the viewers our, our, who came here today to share, to listen, uh, to ask questions. And um, yeah, and um, my very last deed is to say thank you to our funders, our supporters of Kids Radio, especially the projects that we're doing under the EU Council Presidency, and that's the Federal Government Commissioner for Culture and the Media, and the Turing and State Chancery, as well as the Middle Dutch Media Federal, the, region, the regional fund here in uh, the middle of Germany, the MDM. So thanks to everyone and uh, have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Mm -hmm.